and let us be in silence. For those of you who can stand, you may do so. We gather in the presence of God, who knows us when we wake up and when we go to sleep, and in all the moments in between. We gather in the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit, who binds us together as a family, here as well as in all corners of the world. We gather to be the followers of Jesus Christ, who invites us to be known by how we love. Let us gather together to worship God. Let us gather to love one another as Jesus loves.
this is a time for children among us, so children would like to come forward to spend some time up here. Here comes Liam. There's Hannah. Hey. Woohoo. One came and one returned. Hey. Hi, Brendan. Hi. Hi. Let me see. <laughs> Good. And I come here. Okay. Okay. You have us matched. Come on. We have a room here. Anytime. There we go. That's Ellen. And we have a new friend. Hello. Have a seat. All right. Good morning, everybody. Mom can sit here with me. Hey, today we have a lot of big kids here, huh? It's good to have a big kids. Did you know that your parents are kids too? Oh, wow. You're a best friend, you're BFF? Wow, good for you. All right, look, I have a question for all of you. You have to pay attention. How do you know that somebody is a soccer player? Okay, yeah, and your soccer, you, you get hurt. Get okay. Okay. So, how do you know that when somebody is a soccer player? If the soccer player come and, you know, preach like me, do you know that there's a, that person is a soccer player? No. How do you know that the person is a soccer player? Right. You know soccer player only when they play soccer, right? All right, they did a lot of practice too. But soccer players are the ones who play soccer, right? And that's how we know, oh, that person is a soccer player, right? How about the musicians? How do you know that some people are musicians? Yes? They do magic. Oh, that's, that's fine, let's go to magicians. <laughs> I'm adaptive. So how do you know that the person is a magician? Because they do magic, right? They do magic. So magicians are people who do magic and you know by looking at them doing magic, right? Now, musicians. Musicians, did I say right? Musicians. How do you know that somebody is a magician? I just realized that I didn't print it, but that's fine. <laughs> no wonder why I have, I have two magicians. How do you know that somebody's a magician? What do they have? Who are the magicians? Huh? People who play music, that's right. So you know that someone's a magician when they play music, like play piano, play violin, Play trumpet, the guitar, the bells, look at all the bells. So you know that someone is a musician when you see them playing music, right? Do you know that we have all names called Christians? Just like magicians or musicians, we are Christians. Do you know what that means? It means we are the people who follow Jesus, okay? So how do you think people know that we are Christians. How do people know that we are Christians? How do you know that, oh, that person is a Christian? Just like we know how the soccer player, magicians, or musicians, huh? Jesus told about this once to his friends one day. There is only one way that people will know that you are Christians, that you are my followers, by loving one another. Okay, that's what Jesus said. When you love one another, people will know that you are my followers. People will know that you are Christians. Can you say with me? Christians. Christians. So, how do people know that you will be Christians? You are Christians? When you love one another. Can you promise to do that? All right? Liam. I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we all promise to be Christian. That means we're gonna all promise to love 
one another. Whether you are running away or coming back, you're all going to love one another, all right? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you haven't asked us a lot to be your follower. You just ask us to love others as you have loved us. So help us to always remember Jesus' love and let all the people know that we are Christians as we love one another. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who pass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for coming. You can go to the kids' church downstairs, and we're going to all stand and share the peace of Christ with one another. You can walk over to stand down. You can drop him up in here. So uh, we are in the middle of our stewardship uh, campaign that began last Sunday. And we have been following our vision statement, three visions, renew, reflect, and return. And today we are focusing on our second vision, reflecting Jesus through love for one another and for all of God's creation. And you will hear from one of our, one of our own how he and his family found the Jesus reflected in this community. And we are waiting for this father to come back from, from uh, dro after dropping off his son. Uh, here comes Cameron. Here comes the father. Cameron and Christy and their two kids have been part of our church exactly since uh, Palm Sunday this year. And they haven't missed many Sundays until now. So let's hear from Cameron. Thank you. Good morning. That was a little rushed. Today, I was asked to talk about uh, the second of our vision statements, you know, reflect on Jesus through our love for one another and for all. So Pastor Wee asked me to uh, share about the community that I and my family have found here and how that has affected our <clears throat> faith and life's journey. Um, I was honored to be asked, but uh, to be honest, quite scared too. Uh, but I am glad to be here with all of you. So we walked through this building, as we said, on Palm Sunday, about at the end of March of this year. And we've been regularly attending since. We came here broken and searching. I felt I had all the pieces to a beautiful life, yet it was shattered and falling through my fingers. We were bankrupt financially, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You see, we had just spent the past few years poorly self-managing our lives, making many bad decisions. Choices that just, not just figuratively, but literally threatened our lives and those of our loved ones. We lived in denial of our own capabilities and denial of the depth of our despair. We were trying to manage everything ourselves. But things started to change, we started to change. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you noticed us as we sat in the back, you know, weeping through that service or the several subsequent Sundays, all right? But um, we started opening our hearts and our lives differently. We started to accept help even for little things. Let me step back for a minute and fill in more of our story. 
Chris and I have spent all of our adult life and half of our natural lives together. We had a long history even before we decided to have children about 10 years ago. Now we have two kids, Ashlyn, our nine-year-old daughter, and Kellen, our four-year-old son. This is our fifth year in the Boston area where we moved from Nashville, Tennessee. Before that was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Before that was Cleveland, Ohio. Before that was Houston, Texas. This was not the first time we found church. Christy and the kids even came to service in this building, I believe, shortly after we moved here. Uh, back in Nashville, Tennessee, we are actually members of United Methodist Church. Over the years, we have attended uh, many services of many different denominations, and we are even raised going to church, Christy as a Baptist and me as a Catholic. Personally, I always felt I was a man of faith. My mother used to say that she would have been a nun had it not been for my father. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever really believed that. We were much more of the kind of Easter and Christmas type of Catholics, but I could always see the importance of faith in my parents' beliefs. I learned the ritual of church and felt the blessing of baptism. And my godparents had an important influence on my life. My faith was always a source of inner strength and the basis of, of kind of a moral compass. And while it was strong, it was only recently that I realized how fragile my spiritual connection really was. But I was always searching. As a teenager, I read the Bible cover to cover. I read Buddhist teachings. I read some Native American stories. I read parts of the Koran. I even read the Book of Mormon because I had a number of Mormon friends and I wanted to discuss it with them. I did an exchange here in Germany where my host father was actually a Protestant minister. I've always been surrounded by religion. As a trained scientist and until very recently an academic researcher, I literally studied some of the largest questions out there. My field considered 3.3 million light years as small a big, complex, beautiful galaxy consisting of hundreds of billions of stars, like our Milky Way, was often represented as a single point. Our pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan put it, was akin to dust for us. Studying science was a spiritual experience for me, staring at the edge of the abyss of our precise knowledge and marveling at the chain of human ingenuity to get there filled me with a sense of humble awe. This was his universe in my eyes. I guess it's no surprise that I fell in love with the United Methodist Church when the first sermon I went to in Nashville had the pastor quoting Monty Python's The Galaxy Song about our planet hurtling through space. It was a daily miracle. As I learned a little bit more about being a Methodist and the three simple rules, the three simple rules resonated with me. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. But we got busy with our lives. We got distracted. My career took us here and we moved to Watertown. It was a great opportunity at Harvard, and we were pregnant with our second, Kellen. The move was hard. Kellen was born prematurely and with health issues that got us admitted to the hospital six to ten times each of the first two winters. We lived paycheck to paycheck, and Christy was unemployed for, the fir for most of that time, income we were expecting. We had no local family and only a few friends for help, although they were a blessing. I was a promising academic and a well-paid postdoc at elite university, but my limited contract did not have a, a salary that could sustain us. We continued to fracture. And so on Palm Sunday, I awoke in a fit, dark, searching, in anguish. Christy had just relapsed in drinking the day before. I, go I just Googled a local United Methodist church. I woke Christy and told her I was taking the kids to church. She decided to join us. We came here broken and lost. Alcoholism has had a profound influence on our lives for 20 years. However, this was our first year of knowing it by that name. Christy had been attending sporadic AE meetings for only the past year. In my despair, I finally reached past my self-isolation and started participating in Al-Anon about a month prior to coming here at the Watertown site. As we are learning, addiction has played a part in our lives since well before alcohol or drugs touched us. Addiction is a sad disease. It's hard to describe the isolation and self-loathing that develops in it, the despair and hopelessness that grows amid so many blessings. I'm a Caucasian man of privilege with two beautiful, healthy children, working as a promising researcher at elite university. I was broken. I was in despair. I identified with a leper, not the disciple. I felt unworthy. We were lost. But as the Leonard Cohen song states, it's through the cracks that the light comes in. It wasn't one thing here that reached us. Although, sure, there was many special moments, many moments of reaching out to Mike and listening to that, of discussing uh, 
the prodigal son in Bible study. But to me, it was the whole that had helped us continue this journey, the sum of many individual parts. The conversations with Mike, the recovery aware sermons, outreach with Bristol Kitchen, the welcoming, the tolerance, the support of, of recovery in the other building, the reaching out in coffee hour, the meals prepared for us when the small things were just too much, the understanding in people's eyes that addiction is a part of our story, but not all of it, the opportunity to be honest about the good and the bad, the numerous opportunities and efforts by you all to push past the awkward moments and see the people and the hope underneath, the small daily miracles that not just slowly, sometimes stubborn and unwilling, toward more inner peace, more acceptance, one day at a time. Today, I feel more found. I feel that this place has been a crucial piece in the puzzle of our new lives, of our spiritual journey. It links recovery and our daily life. My faith is returning. Our journey is not over and we are still learning to live one day at a time, whatever that means. But I feel blessed today to have you all as part of our spiritual family on this journey. Thank you. Today's scripture is from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 13, verse 31 to 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. God is still speaking. I know that my words would not mean much after hearing what you just heard. So think this as just like a take it or leave it moment. <laughs> but thank you very much. Last week, this week, uh, we have preachers among us. So not, not just eloquent words, but spirit and message. We are in the middle of a stewardship campaign and for the next year preparing. And one of the things the uh, uh, pastors, including myself in this region, in these days, dealing with is this enormous pressure and same enormous helplessness about church growth. That when you hear every corner, every return, the church is declining, mainline church is declining, United Methodist Church is declining, and our congregation, at least in numbers, are not growing. So I had to think about that. I had to, you know, come up with justifications. But most of the times I struggle. 
just like many other pastors and good Methodists who care about the church. I wish I can have the gifts of those amazing preachers that somehow they can draw thousands of people. I, sometimes I said, what are the, you know, the uh, gifts that I don't have to make the church grow? So we read the books, so we go workshops, and you know, we do a lot of things. But if we are to grow the church, which we confess to be the body of Christ, the community that carries the presence of risen Christ, we should better look for the formula that Jesus has given us. And our vision statement it's basically, this, today's text from John is a Jesus formula for growing the church or growing the movement. It's basically saying, this is the way that you can let people know what you are all about, then people will be drawn to you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. You are people who follow me, and that is love one another. I know if I offer a workshop, I know the secret of church growth, and that is love one another. I wouldn't draw a lot of people. It sounds too easy, or it sounds too groovy. Love one another? We all can do that. So we have been growing you know, immensely, so does that mean we haven't been loving one another? That's what you're saying? Sounds simple. Is there a church where people don't love one another, or at least to try to it, or at least to pretend it, that we are here to love one another? That's, no one would disagree that loving one another is important, but not that important. So was Jesus missing the point? I think the catch word here is the love one another just as I have loved you. There was a research about young people saying they love Jesus, right? 19 to 29. Some 80% of more, that, you know, they love Jesus and what Jesus stands for. And even more people don't like church because church is nothing like what they love about Jesus. That was an eye-opening experience. Maybe we have been loving one another, but not in a way that Jesus loved. Because that's not the church of Christians that people, or especially young people, are finding. So how did Jesus love? Jesus loved, when we think about how Jesus loved, we just about suffering, crucifixion, the cross. He had to leave his home. He has wandered around, basically as a homeless. Can we really love like him? Is it too much? Isn't it? impossible. So again, Jesus was asking us impossible tasks, love one another as I have loved you. I don't think so, because otherwise he would not have asked us. There are two ways about the way that Jesus loved us that we found in Scripture. One is in 1 John chapter 4, 19. I have used this in many weddings. It says, we love because he first loved us. The way that Jesus loves is that Jesus loves first. Jesus loves first before he finds anybody worthy of love. Jesus loves first before he's loved first. Jesus loved especially those whom others found it difficult to love first, whether that being sinners, tax collectors, lepers, the unclean, the Gentiles. See, Jesus is not asking us to take the cross and be crucified, lay down our lives, sacrifice anything. Jesus is simply asking us, try to love first, if you want to love one another just like I did. When I first came here, over five years, can you believe it? And that's a Methodist pastor. When I came here, I was a stranger. And before I was able to love you, you loved me first. Okay? Every person who come here as a stranger 
as a visitor who found the community here and stayed are the witness to this first love. Because in order for you to first love, there has to be the someone or some people that have not been known to you, isn't it? So I'm proud of this community. Because I have experienced it. You just heard it. Our vision is to continue to expand this love, first love. So we need to think about who are the ones that our society would find it difficult to love first. Because those are the people that need to be loved first, understood first, accepted first, welcomed first in this community. That's our job in coming years. The second way of Jesus' love that Scripture says in the same chapter, John 13, when he spread the Last Supper on that, you know, Holy Thursday. This is what chapter 13 begins. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The way Jesus loves is that Jesus loves to the end. He first loved, and then he loves to the end. He loved to the end, even the one who will betray him. Remember in that dinner, there was Judas. There was Peter, who will deny him. There are, most of them will no, no longer be there when he was actually dying. But he loved them to the end. See, does that mean that our love has never, you know, should never fail? Okay? I know you love me, but I can tell there are moments that your love have waned out a bit. Same to you. I'm supposed to love you, but there are times that are challenging, okay? Let's be honest. You don't have to look far, you know, homes. Is Jesus asking us or pointing us, see, you cannot be like me because you cannot love to the end? I don't think so. Jesus is not asking us to be perfect all the time. Jesus, I think, just wants us not to give up on love for whatever reasons. That's, to me, what it means to love to the end. We, are, we have faced you know, horror of humanity one more time. It's just terrible. And I was driving the car as I was listening to radio, and first I heard it, and the first emotion was anger. And then I'm, I'm hearing this report from France, the people are starting to feel anger. And it's right. Who wouldn't feel anger? And then we hear the old familiar words, you know, we'll, we'll find this, we'll bring people to justice. We'll respond to this anger in what way? That kill all terrorists, kill all ISIS, kill all extremists. And then it brought me back 13, 14 years ago. That was a similar feeling, or even worse feeling, after 9-11. There was even bigger anger. And the response was the same. We'll kill all terrorists. We'll kill all extremists. So we tried. And 13 years later, what happened? Loving to the end means do not giving up on the power of love as the only way to bring what Jesus wanted to bring. It's tough. It's not easy. But we shouldn't give, that, give, it, give, give up on it. Because that's the only way. Whatever that means for us. I don't want to minimize the suffering. I don't want that there shouldn't be some justice. But the where we come from in responding all whatever happens in our lives, it has to come from the place of Jesus' love. So first love, loving first, and not giving on 
the presence and the power of love. That's what we are called to do. And that's what I experienced it here. And I hope and pray that I cannot, you know, make, get, promise you that there are going to be 200 people, 300 people, 3,000 people in this church. I wish I could promise you to do that. But I can promise to you as your pastor that I myself will never give up on the way of love and will invite you to do the same. And I, oh, I, know, all of, I know all of you have that capacity because you already have done it. And at least people who know about us the people of Belmont, Watertown, United Methodist Church, at least they will know we are Christians. And I think that's good for me, good for you, and above all, that's good for Jesus. Thanks be to God. Let us sing. Stand and sing. Good morning, congregation. Reverend Pastor, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I appreciate it humbly. I'm not sure I have a story to tell, because if I told the story, it would take a very long time. Um, and I heard the humble story this morning. You know, so many of us are going through struggles in our lives, and I don't think there's one person in this room that may not be experiencing any challenging, even myself. But I'm here today because I represent this fine established organization, which is the Hattie B. Cooper Community Center, which is located in Roxbury, Mass. We're located in an area that has the highest concentration of poverty in the entire Massachusetts area, particularly housing. We have a large number of housing development. We primarily serve the low-income families of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and in the greater Boston area. I brought some slides here because I think the pictures sometimes tell the story. And um, I only have five minutes to tell you my story. But I joined Cooper uh, almost four years ago. April 2nd would be four years. I've been in the field of early childhood education for nearly 35 years of my life. 
Uh, it was humble to take on this position. I thought there was a time that uh, Cooper needed me uh, because it was going through some troubles, uh, as many old buildings uh, go through from time to time. Um, I had to step in and address a lot of issues in the building, uh, particularly some of the safety issues. God has blessed us in so many ways. Sometimes you ask, you get. I'm thankful and we are grateful at Cooper that you, the members of this church, every year bring a smile to the faces of the children with all of the beautiful presents that you give us. And they're not just presents. I mean, I have never seen, until I came to Cooper, um, real presence. Uh, when I was in the Head Start program, you know, every year we would get a lot of donations and most of the time, um, you know, someone left them in a box and you don't know what child is going to get those toys. But the children, um, when they open the packages, and many of them take them home, but they see the beautiful wrappings that many of the churches, they decorate them, they personalize them. And I thank you for using your hand and your heart uh, to give and share with our children. We have 100 children enrolled in our program. We serve children between the ages of zero, zero and 12 years old. I have seven babies, 18 toddlers, uh, 54 preschoolers, and 21 after-school kids between the ages of five and uh, uh, 12 years old. Uh, we are a small organization, uh, but we're one of the oldest. We were founded in 1916 by the Women's Methodist Church. And today, we continue to carry on that legacy uh, that the women of Roxbury and the churches that came together to want to make a difference, um, to continue to support families and children, and particularly those families that are low income. We ask that you keep us in our prayers. Uh, continue to support us in any way that you can, whether you come and you donate your hands, your services. Uh, many, many churches have come to us and provide workshops. Uh, they have helped us do repairs, read stories to kids. Um, whatever you can do, we are grateful for that. And you're all the way up in Belmont, is a little distance from us, uh, but you make a big difference uh, to us. So I only have five minutes, so I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm here, um, and I'd love to answer any questions later, uh, but always come visit us. We'd love to see you there. And again, my name is Lily. Thank you.